Well, ladies, welcome. My name is Jill, if I haven't yet met you, one of the women's pastors here. And we also want to say a very special welcome to all those joining us online. So if that's you, welcome. If you're online, if you're in a satellite group, glad that you are joining us. Well, ladies, it's a little bit crazy that this is our last week of Women's Bible Study for our fall session, but what a great session it's been. So thanks for being part of this with us. I have a few quick announcements for us today. Just a reminder again that we do an optional offering here. And so if you, any funds donated to that offering, just go to help support the costs of childcare and Bible study tech and things related to Women's Bible Study. We also want to let you know we are super excited, ladies. We have our Women's Christmas Gathering coming up on Wednesday, December 6th at 7 p.m. It's going to be so much fun this year for maybe the first time ever, I think the first time ever, we are doing a free taco dinner beforehand at 5 p.m. in the church park. So come hungry, bring your friends, it's free. We're serving tacos, rice and beans, horchata. It's gonna be so much fun. So we're excited to do that with you guys before the gathering. Um, and then the gathering will officially start at seven o'clock. Just to make sure that we have enough tacos if you plan to join us for dinner, it would be helpful if you RSVP'd on our website just so we know approximately how many women are coming. But invite your friends, come even if you don't RSVP. You only have to RSVP if you think you'll eat tacos and horchata with us. Another fun announcement, retreat registration opened last week, and we are so excited for women's retreat happening on March 8th and 10th of next year, March 8th through the 10th of next year. You guys, registration has only been open for one week, and we already have 117 women signed up, which is amazing. So if you're one of those women, awesome. If you're not one of those women yet, just want to encourage you, sign up. We would love to have you join us. And then you can get more information on our website. And then finally, uh, this is the last night of our Women's Bible City fall session, you guys. But you'll be on break for several weeks, and then we will be kicking off our winter session next January, starting January. January 9th and 10th. That's going to be a six-week session. We're going to be studying the book of Jonah. So mark your calendars, and we're excited to see you there. Well, we, as you know, we've been in the book of Esther. We've gone through all the different chapters of Esther, and so tonight is kind of our concluding teaching, our summary teaching for the night. We're going to go a little bit shorter than normal to give you guys plenty of time at your tables afterwards. But before we jump in to the teaching for tonight, let me just pray for us, and then we will jump in. Father God, thank you so much for each woman here. Thank you for every woman who's joining us with online groups or satellite groups, God. Thanks for the gift of this fall session of Women's Bible Study and all that you have been teaching us through the book of Esther, Lord. Thank you for your hand that is so clearly seen all throughout the book of Esther, Lord. And even though your name, God, is not directly mentioned in that book, we see you everywhere on the pages of Esther. And God, as we look at our own lives, we see you everywhere in our own lives. And so we thank you, God, that you are always working and that you promise to work all things together for good for those who love you, God. And so, Lord, as we're in this story series this year and as we're kind of ending our study in Esther tonight and ending um, this fall session. God, I just pray that you would speak to us through the remainder of our time together tonight. I pray, Lord, you would speak through your word. I pray you'd speak through me. I pray that you would encourage us, Lord, each of us with the unique stories you've given us. And God, I pray that your story, the greatest story of all, would be so just known and declared and celebrated tonight, Lord. Um, so God, we love you. We pray all this in your great name, Jesus. Amen. Well, ladies, this year of Women's Bible Study, we have been in what we kind of entitled our story series. We're gonna be in the story series for this whole year. So this fall, next winter, and next spring. This fall, we looked at the story of Esther. Next winter and spring, we're gonna be in Jonah and Ruth. But here's the thing about stories. Everyone loves a good story, right? We love to hear good stories. We love to tell good stories. Sometimes we're with people who know the same stories and we're both trying to tell it at the same time. And it's like you're fighting with someone to be like, no, no, I want to tell it. I want to tell my version of the story because we love telling a good story. Some stories are so good that we love to hear them and tell them over and over and over again. I know for me personally, there are some stories about my life that I love to tell. One of those stories is I love telling the story of how I met my husband. And I love telling the story of how it was love at first sight. 
for me, not him. And when I say first sight, I mean it was love upon first sight of his beautifully written online dating profile with six or seven photos, most of which he probably shouldn't have chosen, but he looked cute and I loved his profile. I could tell he was different. I could tell that he loved God. One of the things that most stood out to me in his profile was that he said he played a game called Settlers of Catan, which <laughs> just so happened to be my all-time favorite game. And through all of that, I quickly thought this could really be the guy for me. And 10 plus years later, he was and still is the guy for me. But we love telling stories, right? But if we're honest, we especially love to tell stories that have a happy ending or a good outcome. And when it comes to stories about our own life, we love to tell stories that put us in a good light. We like to tell stories that make us out to be the hero or the good guy in a story, right? But when we look at our individual unique stories in light of what God's word says, we realize that you and I are not the hero of our own story. We talked about this in week one, but we are not the main character in our own story. Whether we believe it or not, God is the main character in each of our stories. And any good that is part of our story is only because of the goodness and the grace of God. The most honest version of my story, the most honest version of your story, shines the light on the truth that we are sinners in need of a savior. Each of us has a unique story, and one of our hopes for the story series, we mentioned this in week one, one of our hope for the, hopes for the story series was for you to learn how your unique story can be used for God's glory, to bring him praise and honor, to point to God. We wanted to encourage you to let your story point people to Jesus. And we shared this in week one, and we see this throughout the story of Esther. God uses the stories of ordinary people like you and me to do extraordinary things for his glory and for his kingdom purposes. And so as we jump in tonight, I want us to look for just a moment at the book of Esther and the way that it begins and the way that it ends because I think it is so interesting to compare the first few verses of how Esther starts and then the last verses of how the book of Esther ends. And I think this might have something to say to us about how we use our stories. So here's how Esther begins. In Esther chapter one, verse one, we read, now in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 provinces. In those days when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in Susa the citadel, in the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all his officials and servants. The army of Persia and Media and the nobles and governors of the provinces were before him while he showed the royal riches, sorry, while he showed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor and pomp of his greatness for many days, 180 days. So that's how the story begins. Here's how the story ends. In Esther chapter 10, here's what we read. King Ahasuerus imposed tax on the land and on the coastlands of the sea and all the acts of his power and might and the full account of the high honor of Mordecai to which the king advanced him are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Ahasuerus, and he was great among the Jews and popular with the multitude of his brothers, for he, that's referencing Mordecai, he sought the welfare of his people and spoke peace to all his people. So I love when you compare those side by side that you see Esther begins with a king who seeks his own glory. He spends 180 days putting his glory on display. But then the book of Esther ends with an ordinary man, Mordecai, who did not seem throughout Esther to be seeking his own glory or his own power, but instead we're told in the last sentence of the book of Esther that Mordecai sought the welfare of his people. Throughout the book of Esther, Mordecai sought what was best for God's people. And in turn, he brought glory to God. And so the invitation for us is to use our stories, not as a way of seeking our glory, but to use our stories and our lives to care about God's people and God's purposes and to bring God glory. When I think about what it means to use my story or what it means to use your story for God's glory, I think about how God wants to use us as his light in this world. And here's what we read in Matthew 5 in the New Testament. Jesus says this, he says, you are the light of the world. 
A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. If you are here tonight, if you're online, if you're in a satellite group and you are a Christ follower, then Jesus says that you are the light of the world. And you probably know that elsewhere, Jesus says he is the light of the world, right? Jesus is the light of the world, but then he also calls us as believers the light of the world. And when I think of that, I think of how that means that we were meant as believers to shine brightly in a dark world and to point people to the true light, which is Jesus. And so if God wants to use you and your story for his glory, if God wants to use your story to point people to Jesus, then what does that look like and how do we even begin to step into that? And so with our time remaining, I just want to share three action steps I think we can take to use our story for God's glory. So three action steps you can take to use your story for God's glory. The first is this. Bring your story into the light. Bring your story into the light. If I wanna use my story for God's glory, then I have to bring my story into the light, meaning I need to honestly and authentically share my story instead of keeping it hidden or keeping it to myself or keeping it in the dark. I need to share the good parts of my story, but I also need to be willing to share and learn to share the more difficult parts of my story. And to do that, which many of you know, takes courage. And we talked a lot about courage in our study, the book of Esther. If you are anything like me, there are parts of your story that you are unbelievably grateful for and parts of your story that you absolutely love to share with people. And then if you're anything like me, there are other parts of your story that you wish were different or maybe you wish altogether that they weren't even a part of your story. As people who live in a sinful, broken world, our stories inevitably contain struggle, difficulty, heartbreak, suffering, loss, sin, mistakes, poor decisions, regret, and the list goes on. But in the darkest parts of our story, we can see God's grace and power shining ever so brightly. And in our areas of struggle, in our areas of weakness, we can see stories of God showing up and using those parts of our story for his glory. Ladies, are there parts of your story that no one else knows? Are there parts of your story that you are afraid to share with others? Or maybe for different reasons, some of which are probably valid, you have chosen not to share those parts of your story. What part of your story, maybe it's small, maybe it's big, what part of your story do you tend to keep hidden? And maybe, just maybe, God wants to bring that part of your story to light as a way to bring you greater freedom, but also as a way to bring greater freedom to others. For some of us, this might mean sharing parts of your story that you've never told anyone or that you've told very few people. It might mean sharing some of those parts of your story with a trusted friend, with your women's Bible study group, with a trusted mentor in your life. For others, it might mean sharing your story with a trained counselor, which is something I've done and many of us here have done as a way of seeking greater healing in different parts of your life. For me personally, when it comes to our stories being out in the light, for me personally, I regularly share one of the hard parts of my story, which is that for most of my life, I have struggled with anxiety. And often God brings people into my life who will say, hey, I struggle with anxiety too. Thank you so much for sh sharing that. Can you encourage me in this? And I get to walk alongside them and encourage them as someone who hasn't just journeyed through anxiety, but who is continuing on a daily basis to journey with anxiety. So to say that I have anxiety is true. I have brought that part of my story into the light. But the more honest version of my story and the version that I don't share nearly as much is that I don't just have anxiety, but I actually have OCD, which many of you will know is called obsessive compulsive disorder. And people with OCD have anxiety 
but it's even beyond that. So you have anxiety, but in addition to that, people with OCD have repetitive, intrusive, unwanted thoughts, and they typically engage in compulsive behavior as a way to try and get rid of the anxiety and to get rid of those repetitive thoughts. And that one sentence description that I just gave you to try and summarize a lifetime of OCD doesn't even come close to articulating how weighty and difficult and extremely mentally burdensome OCD can be. The honest version of my story is that I struggle with anxiety. The more honest version of my story is that I have OCD. The most honest version, we like to talk about stories as the honest version, the more honest version, and the most honest version. The most honest version of my story is that I don't just have OCD. I have a form of OCD called scrupulosity, which is a subtype of OCD that involves religious or moral obsessions. And for someone like me who loves Jesus and loves God's word and wants to be with God forever, this is an awful form of OCD to have. So people with scrupulosity tend to fear that they've offended God, that they've committed some sort of unforgivable sin, that they're going to hell, and the list goes on. This struggle started for me when I was young, when I was in my early teenage years. It went undiagnosed until my early 20s, but there was something so powerful about finally bringing that part of my story into the light with some trusted friends and eventually with a Christian counselor and therapist. And in the more recent years, God has brought a handful of people into my life who actually share this same struggle of the small percentage of people all across the world that share my struggle. God has brought a handful of those people into my life that I get to sit with and we get to empathize together and have compassion for one another and encourage each other because of our own story and what God has brought us through and the healing and freedom that he's brought me through. For me, OCD has always felt like a thorn in my flesh that I wish that I could be rid of. And you might be familiar with the thorn in the flesh terminology because Paul uses that in 2 Corinthians. The Apostle Paul talks about a thorn in his flesh. And here's what he says. He says, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. I can't tell you the number of times, it's definitely more than three, that I've asked God to heal and remove my OCD entirely. And maybe you've prayed something similar about a part of your story that you wish was not a part of your story. And for me, God has not done that for me yet. But instead, he has used this part of my story to teach me about his grace. He's used this part of my story to remind me that I'm not perfect and I will never be perfect. And he's, he's used this part of my story to remind me that I am a sinner in need of a savior and I can't save myself. I need Jesus to do what I could never do for myself. That's the most honest version of my story. If we wanna use our story for God's glory, we need to courageously and intentionally bring our story into the light. And then second, share your story in a way that points people to Jesus. Share your story in a way that points people to Jesus. We talk a lot about the importance of sharing our story, and it is important to share our story. But it's not just important to share your story. It's important to share your story in a way that points people to Jesus and the hope that we have and all the ways that God has been at work in our lives. How we share our story matters. We can share our story in a way that gives God glory, or we can share our story in a way that puts us at the center and gives you and I the glory. For those of us who are Christ followers today, it is important to share your story in a way that points people to Jesus and that showcases everything that God has done in your life. If you're a Christian, I wanna share with you an easy but simple way to think about and write out your story. And the simplest way to do this is to think of your story in three parts. And this is gonna be on a slide behind me and I forgot to tell our awesome slide people, but if you guys can keep that up for a while, that'd be awesome. Um, but it'll be on a slide behind me, but the easiest and simplest way to tell your story is to break it into three parts. And the three parts would be this, who you were before Christ, how you decided to follow Jesus, and who you are today in Christ. So those three parts, and you can see them on the screens. So the first part is, who were you 
before Christ. You can think of things like, here is what I was like prior to coming to Christ, here's what my attitude toward Jesus was like, here's where I found my security and my value, here's where I placed my hope, this is where I was putting my identity before Jesus, but who were you before you gave your life to Christ? Second, how did you come to know Jesus and actually trust him as your Lord and Savior? For instance, you might think about how, how you became aware of your need for Jesus or the truth of who Jesus is. Maybe for you it was different circumstances, maybe it was a uh, story you were reading in God's word, maybe it was an event, a retreat that you were at, a book you were reading, a person in your life, someone shared the gospel with you, God showed up for you. How and what brought you to saving faith in Jesus? And it might also be thinking through what was your understanding of the gospel at that point? When you said yes to Jesus, what did you even mean by that? What did you understand the good news of Jesus to be? And then third, who are you today in Christ? What is true of your relationship with God right now? How have you changed? How do you still struggle? How are you different today than before you said yes to Jesus? What does it look like for you to be following Jesus today. So the simplest way I know to share your story is to break it into three parts. Who you were before Christ, how you came to give your life to Christ, and then who are you today in Christ? As I was preparing for this talk, I took a moment to write out my own story, just using the format that I shared with you. And so here's how I would share my own story. And one thing I'd say to you too is you could share this in a way that takes, let's say 30 minutes to an hour, or you can share this in a way that takes a minute or two. I would encourage you, if you wanna do both, great, but I would encourage you to do the one to two minute version. If someone found you on the street, in an elevator, wherever, and said, tell me, tell me about the good news of Jesus and tell me about how that has played a role in your life and how you gave your life to Christ, like, what would you say in a minute or two, right? So here's how I would share my story. I would say, I don't actually remember my life before Jesus. I grew up in the church and for as long as I can remember, I have always believed in Jesus. I don't even remember the first time I committed my life to Christ. I just remember a lot of times where I recommitted my life to Christ at youth camps and high school camps and they would do altar calls and I was like, I wanna make sure I'm saved, so I'm gonna recommit my life to Christ. Even though, I, I've stopped doing that, you guys, I'm committed. Even though I knew Christ from a young age, I became very aware of my sin and my need for God's forgiveness as I got into my teenage years. I struggled with a lot of sinful thoughts, thoughts that kind of seemed to come out of nowhere. I began to doubt and question whether God could really forgive me for those thoughts and for my sins. And I found myself trying to do or not do certain things as a way of earning my salvation and earning a relationship with God. I believed that God could forgive others for their sins. I just really struggled to believe that he could actually forgive me. I was so scared at the thought that I might end up in hell and live forever apart from Christ. But through prayer, God's word, community, and the help of Christian therapy, I found greater freedom and healing. And a big part of that was the realization that I have OCD. And while OCD is still something I struggle with today, it is also one of the things that reminds me that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I can't save myself, but only Jesus can do that. God has used all of this to put in me a deep passion for sharing the good news with those who don't know Jesus. Although I still struggle with OCD, God's word continues to bring me hope in trusting that I am saved by grace through faith and it is not my own doing, it is the gift of God so that no one can boast. God gives me joy and hope, he gives me peace in the midst of my anxiety and he gives me purpose. That's the less than two minute version of my story told in a way that points people to Jesus. So ladies, if someone asked you right now, hey, tell me your one to two minute version of your story, how confident would you feel doing that? Are you able to share your story in a way that highlights God and his work in your life? If you've never taken the time to think through your story and write it out and articulate it, I wanna encourage you to do that, to spend some time in the next week or two doing that, and I would encourage you to use the format that's been on the screens behind me as a way to do that. So first, if we wanna be people who use our story to give God glory. We need to bring our story into the light. We need to use our story in a way that points people to Jesus. And then finally, we need to share God's story with the world. We need to share God's story with the world. 
our story is part of the bigger story of what God is doing in the world. Our story is important, but God's story is most important. We need to learn to articulate our own story as we just talked about, but we also need to be able to articulate the story of God, the story of the Bible, the story of what Christ has done for us. As Christians, we need to be able to clearly articulate and confidently share the gospel or the good news of what Jesus has done for us. First Peter 3, 15 says, always be prepared. Not sometimes, not most of the time. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. How prepared do you feel today, right now, to share the story of what God has done for us through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection? It is the absolute greatest story ever told, and as Christians, we need to learn how to tell that story, and we need to never grow weary of hearing that story be told. There are some of you here You've been part of Bible City for maybe years, maybe just the last seven weeks. There are some of you here who have never said yes to the good news of what Jesus has done for us. You're not living in a right relationship with God. Your story is all about you. You are at the center of your story. And if you're honest, what you're doing with your story, it's not really satisfying. You sense that there has to be something more. Something has to be missing. This can't be all that there is to your story, and that's because it's not. If that's you, I want you to hear the good news and the story of what Jesus has done for you and give you a chance to respond and to invite God to have a relationship with you and to change your story forever. There are others of you here, many of you here, who you've heard the greatest story of all time. You know what Jesus has done for you and you've said yes and you're following Jesus, but I want you as well to hear again tonight the greatest story ever told, the gospel, the good news of what Jesus has done for us. May we never weary of hearing the story of God. May it be the story that we want to hear over and over and over and over again, and may it be the story we want to tell over and over and over again because of how good it is. And may it always remind us of God's great love and grace and mercy towards sinners like you and me. I want to close and do a few things, but I want to invite you to take a posture that's comfortable for you, but I want to invite you to close your eyes and just let this be a moment between you and God. And as you do that, I wanna just share with us the story that many of us know, some of us have maybe never heard, but I just wanna share with us, for the first time or the hundredth time, the greatest story ever of what God has done for us through his son, Jesus. And again, this is between you and the Lord. Greatest story ever told says this, we were created by God and for God. He loves you. He loves you deeply, he has purpose for your life, he created you on purpose and for a purpose. But the Bible also tells us that we've all sinned, meaning we've all missed the mark of how God designed us to live. We've all fallen short of his glorious standards. Each and every one of us, none of us are exempt. Each and every one of us has messed up, we've made mistakes, we've sinned, we've rebelled against God, And the penalty for that sin is death. That's what we owe. If we really want what we deserve, then what we deserve is death. But God, in his great love and mercy and grace, God sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to live a perfect life on this earth, to live the perfect life that we could never even attempt to live, nor could we ever live. Jesus lived a perfect and obedient life. He took all of our sin upon himself, He went to the cross and he died for our sin. He died for my sin and he died for your sin because he loves us and he paid the penalty we owe so that we don't have to and he rose three days later. And everyone, not just some, but everyone who placed their faith in Jesus as their Lord and Savior will be made right with God, forgiven for their sins, and they will receive the gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus. God's word tells us that when you give your life to Christ, when you say yes to Jesus and confess him as your savior, you're made new by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit dwells in you as a new creation when you give your life to Christ. And so for those of you here who know Jesus, you can just sit, you can pray for anyone in this room or online or in a satellite group that doesn't yet know Christ, but I just want you to sit and just soak in the story of what Jesus has done for you. 
And for those of you here who've never said yes to Jesus, what, what's holding you back? What's your obstacle to faith? Pray. If there's something holding you back, pray and say, God, this is what keeps me from saying yes to you and invite him to show up for you in that. But if you are ready to say yes to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can simply pray this prayer. You can say, God, I confess that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Forgive me for my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ took our sin upon himself. He went to the cross. He died for my sin. He rose three days later. And I'm putting my faith and trust in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. God, I commit to following you all the days of my life. And if you prayed that prayer, ladies, your story, whether you know it or not, has forever changed. The trajectory of your story has changed forever in the best way possible, and we welcome you into the family of God. And if you prayed that prayer, we celebrate with you. We're so excited for you. And would you please let me or Tanya or one of your table leaders know so that we can follow up with you and help you take next steps, including getting baptized. But we are so excited for anyone who made a first-time decision to follow Jesus. As we close, I wanna give us one more way to respond. For those of you here who do know Christ, who have placed your faith in him, whether you did that five seconds ago or 50 years ago, I just wanna invite us to sit with the Lord when it comes to our own story. And we talked about using our story for God's glory. And I just want to invite you to sit and say, God, in the midst of you know, all this talk about using my story for your glory and bringing my story into the light and sharing my story honestly with others and sharing it in a way that points people to Jesus and God, sharing your story in the gospel, just sit for a moment and just say, God, what are you, what are you inviting me to? What's the next step you want me to take in my story or with my story? Just say, God, how do you want to use my story for your glory? And what, if anything, are you asking me to do? And then finally, if you are sitting here and feeling like, God, I do want you to use my story for your glory, and maybe there are ways God's already doing that, that you're leaning into that, or maybe you've never really leaned into that, but if you want God to use your story for his glory in the days and the weeks and the years ahead, then I just want to encourage you to pray that, to just say silently, or you can say it aloud or under your breath, to just say, God, Use my story for your glory. And God, for every person who prayed that, I pray that, God, would you keep using my story for your glory, Lord. For everyone who prayed that, I just pray that you would give us opportunities tonight at our Bible study groups. Give us opportunities this week, Lord, in the months and years ahead. Would you Use our stories for your glory and would you bring people into our lives, Lord, who need to see how you've been at work in our lives, who need us to point them to you, Jesus. So use us, send us, Lord. We are yours. Do with us whatever would bring you glory, God. We pray in your great name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.